Thanks, Michael. You've let me know I'm standing between people in a break. Okay. <laughs> um, Hello, happy afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Ellen Dunham Jones. I'm a professor of architecture, and I direct the Master of Science in Urban Design degree here at Georgia Tech. I also am host of the Redesigning Cities podcast and lecture series, and I really we have some great live events. Uh, but you know, if you're interested in just listening and watching, we I really recommend subscribing. Um, what I also do is I maintain the world's only database that tracks suburban retrofits. Basically, what's happening with dead malls, dying office parks, aging garden apartment complexes, strip malls, all, all the commercial corridors, all the stuff that we've been building for the last 60 or 70 years that is starting to age, it's performing really badly, and it was built to support a lifestyle that we now recognize is one of the least sustainable uh, out there. So um, I track the examples where those property, these prototypical suburban property types have in fact actually been retrofitted into more sustainable places. Um, and usually, what I'm all what I'm really doing is, uh, I'm I'm documenting and analyzing the urban design strategies that are being used, and I'm sharing those with communities to help them both envision and implement change. Uh, Today, though, I'm actually going to present sort of some of the preliminary results from a um, a research project that uh, I've been really delighted to be, to be working on with some urban design and civil engineering students. So my database right now has about 2,000 entries in it, and that's just the tip of the iceberg. I mean, at a certain point, I kind of stopped tracking some of the categories because there are just too many <laughs> of them. Um, they, they begin to repeat so much. About so about in the database right now, about 2,000, about half of those are redevelopments where there's substantial infrastructure changes being made. Uh, about a quarter of them are re-inhabiting that box, existing box, with more community serving uses, but not making a lot of changes to the infrastructure. And then there's about 20% are corridor retrofits, restriping, whatever, changing the corridors themselves. And only about 2%, well, no, it's about 5% um, of the projects are re-greenings because we never should have built there in the first place. And we really need um, to do those. So the, the research project is called the Shore Gap, and we have uh, posters on display. Um, it's an extension to one of John Crittenden's uh, RIPS awards from N the NSF. And it's really trying to help us understand the gap between the idealized, sort of simulated models of how, OK, if we could move all these bits and pieces around and make really sustainable cities, you know, how would they perform versus what's actually happening on the ground in these actual projects that are doing some of this stuff. So the first goal was simply to understand which infrastructures are more likely to be, cha are changing more frequently than others. And so a simple keyword analysis in the database very clearly showed transportation is the big winner. Um, a lot, there's really a lot of work of infrastructure changes going into making a lot of these suburban properties more walkable, more bikeable, more connected, um, access to transit, all of those kinds of things. Uh, the second kind of infrastructural change are inf uh, we would call the social infrastructure. Uh, so ch inclusion of affordable housing, of multifamily housing and it, that often the first in, an, in a suburban neighborhood. Um, a lot more gathering spaces, mix of uses. So a lot of the land use kinds of changes. Now, improvements to water and sewer infrastructure show up 
less frequently. Um, although almost any project that's been done since 2007 now has some degree of green infrastructure given EPA uh, requirements now, it, that's really the norm. But it's only really emphasized in about 2% of the projects in my database. We're just not seeing it really at scale. And I'd say the same is basically true of energy infrastructure as well. Use of renewable energy, district energy, uh, CCHP is even less frequent. Only 1% of the projects in the database. Uh, so, you know, I mean, solar appears, but it's kind of in token amounts. CCHP will appear in the really large redevelopments, but not, not in any of the smaller ones. So that tells us something about just sort of which infrastructures are happening at, at the moment. The second goal was to actually try to measure really how, uh, how much more sustainable are these projects, how are they actually performing, and that gap between what we model and what, how they're doing. So the bad news is there is very little data out there. <laughs> um, th we found zero correspondence between the 2,000 projects in my database and national databases on energy performance, water performance. Um, we, we've, uh, transportation, we, we were a little better. Uh, back data is especially hard to get. So in terms of trying to show, before, get that before and after delta, you know, before they, it was retrofitted and after, that back data is a challenge. Um, and even the current data tends to be not be fine-grained enough. All of the health data is at a county level. It just it, it doesn't help. Most of the transportation data is at the census block scale. Uh, energy is either at the scale of the grid or at the building scale. It's not at the neighborhood scale, sort of at that 100-acre kind of chunk size. So we reduced our sample size to a much more geographically detailed subset of the database that was just the 347 enclosed shopping malls that are being retrofitted. Um, those, we still, no automated data. <laughs> we just couldn't get, we tried scraping all sorts of stuff. Um, and just, we did get some great transportation data from the Housing Plus Affordability Index, which is a really super website I strongly recommend. So we recognized that we were going to have to produce the data ourselves. So we decided to do some deep dives, and we reduced our sample size to eight. So <laughs> the, the, the process um, on this was a little different. But it's a very limited sample set, but the preliminary results, and, the, and these, the preliminary results still need further refinement, but the good news is we've absolutely clearly found that significant improvements in transportation, average block size decreasing 65%, intersection density increasing 54%. I mean, that, that's absolute, that impacts walkability in a very big way. Add to that, the length of bike lanes increased 167%, and the length of the amount of just side, linear sidewalks increased 786%. So there's some good news. Um, there are also some good improvements in meeting stakeholder goals. We found 188% average increase in the amount of gathering space, outdoor gathering spaces. Um, in these projects. There's much more sort of public communal uh, activity happening in those. 66% uh, increase in the average home value. Kind of surprising results on school test scores. Some went up, some went down. Um, that, I, I want to dig, I'd love to dig into more why the ones that went down did, uh, speculative ideas anyway. Um, water was also, is also, I, I'd love to get even more data kind of on, but even with significant densification, as a lot of these places, are, I mean, a, a tip, a lot of, we have now uh, well over 60 dead malls that have become new downtowns. They have a street grid, retail at ground, apartments and offices up above, um, and we have about another 90 in process. 
of those. So, you know, e these projects, even with significant densification, tree canopy and permeable surface increased a lot, often tripling um, or more. So, uh, it's all those street trees really makes a difference. Somewhat mixed bag on the energy infrastructure. While energy, ener we definitely found that densification in those redevelopments meant that energy demand went up, but at the same time, energy use intensity went down. But, and we also found that each of the, the five redevelopments had some solar, two had uh, CCHP, but the amount of on-site energy generation does not equal the amount of new energy demand. So we're still not perfect. I have a new book coming out next summer on how retrofits are helping 20th century suburbs address the 21st century challenges that they were never designed for, like climate change, equity, the loneliness epidemic, and of course, automobile dependency. I would love to continue this work and collaborate with others, especially on ways to get the back data automate measurements and data collection and estimation. And ultimately, really, I would love to develop a set of universally comparable performance metrics based on accessible data that cities themselves can track and benchmark um, you know, how they are really doing and, under and understand this stuff. So thank you very much. <laughs>